Um, I did have the great honor to serve here as dean uh, in the late uh, 1990s through early 2000s. And uh, th this institute really, to my, it it's just a natural outgrowth of that period of time and frankly of a much, much longer tradition at the Haas School. And, and I want to say in general what is really true about institutions, so I've been a dean at two institutions, is that really each generation builds on all of the hard work of the previous generation. So everyone here in this room is building on the, 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 the generations that help make the space possible, that help contribute in every single way to the ranking of the school today. And in the, way, in the institute I'm going to talk about, uh, it is really came from uh, largely from students working with the dean's office, then from some external funders. And when I get to today's institute, which builds on the things in the late 1990s, I'll just try to show you the kind of history and threads. Okay. The first thing is I want to refer you to the fact that this new institute, it's been around, firm, formally launched in November of last year, does have a, a website. And the website does have a really nice history. So I'm not going to repeat all of that. I'm just going to do the, the, a couple of high points. Um, the first high point of the history is that there is a very long tradition at the Haas School, uh, which uh, predates the name Haas. It really is the Berkeley Business School. And it predates the flurry of interest of business schools around the world now in business and society. We were a very early actor in business and society. And actually, some of the most interesting thinking about how business contributes to society, how business depends upon a stable society, how business depends upon a prosperous society, some of the earliest thinking went on at the Berkeley Business School under the leadership of then uh, pre uh, dean his, in his pre dean uh, role Ed Scheidt, Bud Scheidt. So just so you know, there's a long intellectual tradition at the school thinking about the relationship between business and society. That's partly probably because this is a major business school in a major public institution. It is also important to remember that this was the first business school. Uh, the first major public business school uh, by uh, many, many decades. Basically, there's Wharton as the private first business school, and there is Haas as, or Berkeley as the first public business school. So there's a long tradition of thinking about business and society. Now, let me fast forward to uh, the late 1990s, and I'm going to because this institute builds on some things that happened then. There were uh, a very large, in fact, the largest group of students in the country, uh, business school students who were part of a business for social responsibility group. Uh, it today is called Net Impact. Um, and those students then were thinking very hard about curriculum activities, way, the way to provide students with the right training, the right competencies, the right experiences, the right networks to go into careers where they could uh, exercise their desire to, or realize their desire, their, their goals, personal goals, to have a meaningful life of both in the business world but achieving uh, a social mission. So putting a kind of social mission at the forefront and then thinking about the effectiveness of business to achieve that mission or of business school skills to help achieve that mission. So the way that played out in the late 1990s was really two ways. One was there was just then a growing interest in what was called at the time corporate social responsibility. It is still called that, although terminology tends to have moved now to corporate sustainability. And this is about the role, frankly, of large corporations, often multinational corporations, in thinking about two things. In thinking about how their activities affects broader society, i.e. environmental concerns is an obvious one, 
or how they can, through their activities, raise standards around the world. You might think of this in terms of large multinational companies and what they do, what they try to do in terms of their own uh, safety standards or their own wage standards, their own um, labor practices in the large entities that they run abroad. So there are two ways to think about this, but, but a lot of students here were thinking about that issue. A lot of companies were just beginning to think about that issue. There was a lot of pressure on companies to think about that issue if they were bad actors. So out of that grew some funding uh, and uh, the, the beginning of what became the Center for Responsible Business, which is now housed in the Institute. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So think about corporate sustainability, CSR, Center for Responsible Business, really growing out of this set of interests of the students, a few external funders. And by the way, one of our external funders, Paul Newman. And Paul Newman was a funder, why? Because Paul Newman said from the very beginning about his company, I'm using my face for the greater good. I am going to take all the profits from my company and it, they are going to be dedicated to nonprofit activities to make society a better place. A very interesting uh, way he came to the, to, to the Haas School and sort of said that. It was great. So we had CSR, uh, which we call corporate responsibility. There was something else going on. There were this has always been a school which has great interest in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial startup ventures. How can we kind of create something new to do something important? So out of that grew uh, a center, uh, an activity called the Social Venture Competition, which today is called the Global Social Venture Competition. So it's the longest running global competition among business school students, teams of business school students from all around the world. Uh, you develop the idea for an entrepreneurial venture. It can be for profit, it can be not for profit, but it's solving a social mission. Uh, and I'll give you a few slides about that. But that grew out of that same period of time. Again, student interest at external funder. By the way, in that case, the main triggering external funder was Goldman Sachs Foundation. Uh, and uh, we put together, the students put together this activity, which has been run by the students ever since, with the help of the school. Uh, we put some resources in it in terms of the Lester Center, and this year I put some of my own uh, effort and time into it. Um, one other thing that happened, we have a center for nonprofit uh, leadership, we had a center for nonprofits, uh, but there was an increasing understanding that uh, in order to solve big social problems, ultimately what is usually required is a partnership among nonprofits, the public sector, and the private sector. You usually don't get a solution if you have just one actor. So we, uh, the, the Haas School built up uh, in the period, really from the late 1990s through, uh, through now, it took the center for nonprofits and built it into a very powerful center for nonprofit and public leadership. So this is the idea, again, that when you're looking at these big problems, environmental sustainability, um, safety for workers in Bangladesh, you, you actually have to have government actors business actors, and nonprofit institutions. So that's how we developed a bunch of activities at the school. Uh, and then uh, it, it seemed like the right moment uh, in the past couple of years as Dean Lyons was building out uh, the defining principles of the school, what defines us, that we should take these activities build them out, extend them, uh, brand them more effectively, raise resources from them, add new activities that are complementary. And all of that uh, is behind the formation of the Institute. Uh, not to mention the fact, and again this goes to the, the purple that you all are wearing, is that creating an Institute requires some upfront funding. And there were two major donors here who actually helped to uh, put together the initial funding for the institute. So that's my way of history. Uh, let me say, uh, I'll go through a few slides. We had a formal launch event for the institute uh, this year, and I'm gonna show you a film from that because we had some absolutely 
amazing, insightful, inspirational presentations by alumni, and I'll get to one of those. We can see a film of it. But in the launch event, we, we basically brought people together to try to understand why we were creating this institute at this time. So everything I said is kind of the history to, to get to this. Um, and uh, this is, of course, as I said, part of the reason we're doing this is because um, we have defined ourselves as a school now. We have embraced the power of culture and the distinctiveness of our culture with the defining principles, question the status quo, student always, confidence without attitude, and beyond yourselves. Now, I'm going to tell you an interesting cultural story. Uh, back in the 1998, when I became dean, I did a little marketing strategic study. And I was advised not to play up the public spiritedness, distinctive culture of the Haas School. Because we were competing with other tough-minded business schools. Why would we want to say, well, we're the progressive Berkeley. You know how Berkeley is, uh, the image of Berkeley, really? Is this a really serious business school? So the idea was, don't do that. Don't, don't differentiate yourself. What's really interesting, of course, is we've had the complete erosion, dramatic erosion, of public confidence in business. We had it through the scandals of the early 2000s, things like Enron, WorldCom. We had it through the financial crisis. By the way, business schools around the country are defining themselves on social impact and social mission and be beyond yourself and question the status quo. So what was distinctively, I think, always true, I, I think these are things that have always been true of the Berkeley culture, completely true. But for a while, that isn't what you would bring attention to. And now, I think we want to say, by the way, we were there. We've always been there. This is really us. You're pretending. Right? So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, this, is, uh, this is part of what we're doing. Um, all right, so what is the mission? Uh, we had a large conver set of conversations around the school to develop a mission statement. And uh, you'll see that it is innovative. We want to emphasize uh, entrepreneurial innovation pressing social and environmental challenge. And we want to empower. It's empowering people. And what I like to say is we empower people to have, you can do this in different ways. You can go work in, a, in Walmart as a CSR uh, buyer. We had one of our students, one of our alumni here talking about that at the launch event. That's one way you can do it. You're empowered to go work in a large company. You're empowered to start a small business. You're empowered to go and be on the board of a nonprofit. All of these things to help solve pressing social and environmental challenges. So that's our mission. Um, as I said, it builds on the school's history of these, of our leaders who think, uh, question the status quo and think beyond themselves our real mission. Um, and this requiring leadership across all sectors, I've already made that point. That's my personal passion here, maybe because I've been in the business community, I've been in the nonprofit space, and I've been in the public sector. And I personally believe that where I've seen solutions work, they've involved the partnerships of all three. So that's why we emphasize that. Um, Obviously, our goal is to achieve uh, our mission to build this more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable society, uh, to train leaders who can work across traditional boundaries. This is the point about uh, cooperation across different kinds of organizations. And then I, we added a third, just to make it clear that uh, social entrepreneurs to create new solutions to uh, existing uh, challenges. So those are the goals. Now, the objectives. Um, these are things like, you know, what are we trying to achieve on a day-to-day -day basis, right? We're trying to save the world, make it more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable, and give people the power to do that. That's our broad, sweeping mission. On a day-to-day -day basis, what, how are we trying to achieve that? Uh, we're trying to take what we have. Now, we have a lot. So what I want to emphasize is part of this is bringing attention to what we have attention to the business community, attention to our alumni, attention to our recruiters, attention to the faculty who haven't been involved in this activity. We want to bring attention to it, but we have a lot to build on. So ethics, responsible business leadership, sustainability, nonprofit. 
Uh, health management. One of I, I haven't talked a lot about health management, but one of our constituent parts is we've always had a strong relationship with the School of Public Health. We always have a number of our students who are working in the health field on public health solutions or uh, solutions to global health issues. So public health is there, global health is there. Global economic development. Uh, we have had for a very long time a, uh, maybe some of you have were on this course, a course uh, in international business development. It's a project course where students work with companies and nonprofits around the world to, to address market issues or social issues or usually a combination of both in developing economies. So we've always had that. Uh, and social entrepreneurship, we've had this global social venture competition. So we're going to build on them. Uh, why? Well, part of it is to promote synergies and, and, and coordination. When you build up a lot of small units, which we successfully did, you want to make sure that uh, we get uh, two and two is five rather than two and two is four. And you can do that if you coordinate, so that's important. Uh, catalyze research and faculty engagement. In this area, and it's true not just at Berkeley, but it is true in other business schools, there is oftentimes a dichotomy between the research faculty and these kinds of activities. Well, it turns out wonderfully that in the last several years, a number of our faculty have become engaged in one form or another with these kinds of issues. So we want to help them. We want to catalyze what's there. We want to encourage faculty. I've had a number of meetings with the research faculty, uh, getting more of them involved, say, in the Center for Responsible Business or in Impact Investing, sort of saying, let's, let's figure out what you are doing in your traditional research that's linked to these areas. Um, adding new activities. So part of this is to say we now are looking at all of the course offerings across the centers that exist in health, in entrepreneurship, in nonprofit leadership, in responsible business. We looked at all of the course offerings. This year, for the first time, everyone came together to put forward a integrated plan for course offerings next year. And in doing that, we think about, well, what's missing? What's missing? So uh, next year, we're going to have uh, Lester Center is going to add a course on uh, lean, launch uh, uh, lean Launch Entrepreneurship for Social Enterprise. So Lean Launch is kind of the new approach, the hot new approach to entrepreneurship. It's revolutionizing the way people teach traditional entrepreneurship. We're going to introduce a course next year that looks at that in terms of social sector entrepreneurship. That's an example. Um, we are looking at more uh, uh, complete integration of the basic finance classes uh, that exist in the core curriculum with the students growing interest in what's the broad area of impact investing, investing for social and financial return. Um, we decided that, uh, that we should also build on uh, Kelly McElhaney's efforts to begin courses on women in business. We have, uh, a, now we have an MBA course and we have an undergraduate course and we have an executive MBA not executive MBA, an executive education course for women, which has gotten so popular we're now adding. So we'll have it twice a year rather than once a year. And um, it turns out here, uh, amazingly enough, there's really not much going on at other major business schools. So as I said, a lot of major business schools now, if you go and look, they've embraced kind of the social impact area or the corporate responsibility area. There's not a lot on, on gender. Uh, and since I've been working for the World Economic Forum for a long time on this issue, and Kelly's working on this issue, and corporations are very interested in this issue, the power of diversity in, uh, in decision making, uh, we're going to build on that. So our objectives are to add activities, and basically that's one of the early ones, and then to build the brand. Well, I've already talked about building the brand. We want to get the message out there that we are who we are. Um, and that we can be, that we are a leader here already, and we will continue to promote in this area. Um, how to do that? Attract funds to support and extend activities and to initiate new ones. I honestly want to say, and this is just a reality of the world of funding in business schools, is there are some major business schools who've gotten very significant gifts and have no history in this space, and now they are 
competing for faculty, competing for researchers, competing for experts to come to make something there that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. You use the funding to create, to build something that doesn't exist. We have things that exist and they're actually highly ranked and very successful and we want to extend them. But in order to extend them, you do need funds to support them. Um, the centers and programs, I'm just going to put them down here. The way this, the institute was set up, uh, this is a little bit of how UC Berkeley organizes itself. If you have a number of centers, and you want to coordinate and bring activities together and fundraise at that level, you house them in something called an institute. That's why it's called an institute. The institute builds on these centers, and I've already talked about each of them, so I don't need to say a lot about them, but these are the centers that already existed that had very successful histories, at least 10, 15 years of history, uh, and we were, were building on them. So I work closely with the heads of all of these activities. And indeed, the uh, co-head of the, of the institute with me is Christy Rabe, and she's been involved in the Graduate Program for Health Management uh, for uh, at least a decade. So these are the centers. I, I personally, I, I mean, I've kind of, in a way, revealed by what I've said that I, I ultimately believe that for business schools, it, that's the right way to think about it because what, what the business community brings to this, what the, what the doing it for uh, with some market return that generates sustainability is it generates sustainability. You can't, you can't depend upon a public funding stream or a nonprofit funding stream. As again, if it's a huge problem and you want to make a scalable, sustainable solution, you've got to find a revenue generating stream. So I actually, one of the things that I am very intent on is to make sure that what, as we think through activities to add, or organizations to connect to, that we have that as a defining principle for us. So yes, I completely, completely agree. Um, so, uh, and by the way, that story about the African uh, Innovation Hub, so one of the things, one of the things that inspired me when I was uh, in London was, uh, although it's a flawed book, it's a great book to read, uh, there was a, a, a business professor named C.K. Prahalad, and he wrote uh, the first book about bottom of the pyramid opportunities. So he was from India, and he really believed that uh, businesses could solve effectively some of the very large social problems if they defined that as their mission. So their first idea was, I want to solve this problem. Let me think about the technology, let me think about the financing, let me think about the distribution, everything I need to do to solve the problem. But you have to start with the problem. Of course, what the hubs do is in order to understand the problem, you have to be pretty close to the person or the group whose problem you're trying to solve. So we have like uh, we have uh, one of the great uh, sort of people thinking about design uh, at, uh, at the Haas School, Sarah Beckman, and she's been very involved in helping to push through the design concept into the business school curriculum and the way our students think about the world. Of course, that's exactly the starting design principle. So if you want to go solve a problem for uh, a for rural women in India, you are going to have to have some way of being with them for some period of time. One, I met recently one of the women who started uh, an enterprise. She was in the global social venture competition here. She actually didn't, her plan didn't win. She ended up going to uh, Stanford Business School. Uh, she has a company called Embrace, and Embrace now is an IPO'd company. I mean, so, so you can find a way to uh, create a model which is uh, sustainable. She spent two years outside of the United States working in the place where the problems were to be solved. Yeah. So we have a great, uh, we have a very nice website, and I'm trying to encourage conversations, just like the conversation we're having, um, through through a blog. And I've got a really uh, good, they're fun blogs to read. I encourage all of you to get into this blog site because I hired a really good New York Times editor to help us do it. <laughs> so part of it is to translate faculty stuff into engaging stuff that you all can read. Um, 
And we, we do things like that. We, we actually have, uh, in, we're hoping to encourage dialogues exactly like the kind that we have, okay? Thought leadership, this is an area which is evolving. Uh, people have different definitions of what social impact means, what impact investing means. Um, we want to be thought leaders here in the blog is one way we hope to do that. So I encourage you to get involved. We had uh, the launch event in November here, May 21st in New York. If any of you are going to be there, we'd love to have you. It's uh, a beautiful, we're having it at Generation Investment. Generation Investment is a socially responsible investment firm. Uh, and uh, they have a beautiful facility there in a lead building. Uh, and we're going to uh, be having an event there. Uh, next week, we're having our first annual distinguished speaker, and that's Helen Gale, who's the president and CEO of Care USA. Again, think about it. That is a very old, very traditional, in many respects, philanthropic social mission organization. They are changing what they do. They are changing what they do over time to do much more of how can we support uh, entrepreneurial ventures. How can we help? Uh, women and children create businesses uh, that will sustain them. Um, and then uh, I've really already talked about our initial activities and goals, coordinate activities, harmonize the curriculum, develop strategy, explore strategy. So I think I'm going to stop and show you the film now. Um, the film is by one of the distinguished alumni of the school uh, who essentially, well, he t I want you to hear his own story. Um, but he has found a way to have significant scale effect and social impact. And he came here and he developed this idea. And today he has a very successful activity, which you will know about once you see the film. So why don't we go with the film? Good afternoon. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> I am so happy and so proud of Haas to be launching this institute. And what better leader than Laura Tyson to take it forward. And really honored to be a part of this inaugural event. So I've been asked to share a little bit about my personal story. And um, I reckon that's because I have the weirdest story of uh, today's five speakers. <laughs> Uh, at the tender age of 22, fresh out of Yale, I decided that I wanted to change the world. And that the best way for me to do that was to buy a one-way ticket to Nicaragua and go <laughs> off and join the revolution. This was 1983. <laughs> so off I went, thinking I would stay for a year or two. I ended up staying for 11. Uh, I was 22 years old when I went away. I was 33 when I came home. And I spent that time living in some of the most remote mountain communities that um, you can imagine, working with farmers, organizing co-ops, training farmers in business skills and agricultural skills. And um, it was amazing, right? For a, uh, a wannabe revolutionary cowboy from Austin, Texas, <laughs> to be able to uh, wear blue jeans and cowboy boots every day and ride horses and, and motorbikes up into the mountains and eat rice and beans three times a day for 11 years. That was pretty cool. <laughs> but the work, the work grew frustrating. And, and then it grew disillusioning. Because what I was doing was working on one well-intentioned international aid project after another designed by very well-intentioned, smart people sitting in cities around the global north, sending millions of well-intentioned dollars to alleviate poverty. And in my experience, more often than not, we failed. We failed to help people on the ground, in the communities, develop their own capacity to solve their own problems. I think more often than not, we simply recreated dependency on aid. And so I became very um, disillusioned. And then in 1990, after seven years in the field, quite by accident, I discovered these crazy people in Europe who called themselves fair traders and whose slogan was trade, not aid, and whose model was to support sustainable development and, and better livelihoods for farmers by buying direct and paying a better price. 
So armed with this very powerful idea, I went off into the hills again and spent months telling farmers about it and trying to recruit people to this new idea. And um, after all that work, I was only able to put together um, a very small cooperative of 20 people. Nicaragua's very first fair trade coffee co-op. And with 20 farmers, we had enough coffee to fill one container. <laughs> and we shipped that container in the summer of 1990 to a fair trade buyer in England. And a few months later, we got back our money. And after cost, we had one dollar per pound for our farmers, for their coffee. At a time when the local middleman was paying 10 cents a pound, we got our farmers a dollar. Well, you can imagine how excited people were. Uh, overnight, my new nickname became Pablo Un Dollar. <laughs> I was a very popular guy. And over the next couple of years, we organized 3,000 families all over northern Nicaragua into this co-op that was receiving coffee and processing, adding value and exporting direct. And by virtue of this dramatically higher revenue, we were able to do amazing things. Amazing things that previously we probably would have depended on government or well-intentioned NGOs to come and do for us or not. So we kept farmers on the land. Our farmers were able to eat three times a day, a day instead of once or twice. We started scholarship programs to keep kids in high school because high school's still a luxury in so many rural developing world villages. We rebuilt schools. We ran health programs. We started the first organic certification program in the country. And by virtue of organic certification, we got our farmers more money. We invested in quality. We taught farmers to smell and to taste their own coffee. And by virtue of the improved quality, we got our farmers more money. We invested in infrastructure. We invested in productivity. We did all this stuff. <laughs> so much progress in economic and social terms. And none of it thanks to anyone's charity. And I'm not saying there isn't a role for charity. But none of this was made possible through international aid. It was all made possible thanks to this really potent, powerful idea of a, a fair price for a great product. And so, of course, the invisible dividend around all of this for our farmers was hope and pride and dignity and a sense of self-reliance that only comes when you do it for yourself. Uh, as you can imagine, my four years at the helm of this co-op um, were transformational, not only for all the folks that I worked with, but for me. Uh, it totally changed my perspective on sustainable development and on markets. I mean, up until that point, I was um, a proud <laughs> anti-capitalist. I thought markets were the problem. And that experience opened my eyes to the reality that markets are the most powerful force for change that we could hope to have. And that partnerships with responsible companies and conscious consumers could quite likely be the most effective model for empowering the poor on a journey out of poverty. So then I had this huge identity crisis because I was living the life. I was having a great time. I married the most beautiful gal in town. I had a Nicaraguan kid. Why would I want to come back to the States? Why would I want to come home? But fair trade at that point was booming in Europe and there was nothing happening in the U.S. And so a growing sense of obligation um, became a, a sense of calling. And I realized I had to come home. So for me, Haas was homecoming. I came home to Haas. Of all the business schools that I looked at and applied to, this was the place that I chose to come to, and, and it was the best fit for me that I could imagine. Not just for the tools that I got here. Um, the progressive values of this place made me feel at home coming from a revolutionary environment and 11 years in the field. <laughs> I felt at home here. You know what? Uh, uh, dear friend Ben Lee, 
Um, and John Freeman's uh, entrepreneurship class had such an impact on me. I wrote the, the business plan for Fair Trade USA as, uh, in John's entrepreneurship class. And, of course, this was 94 to 96, so this was a time when the Internet was just starting to boom, and so many of my classmates were dreaming up entrepreneurial ventures. And so while no one really talked about social entrepreneurship, um, I felt um, in good company with people who wanted to do crazy stuff and uh, who wanted to change the world. So um, I got out in 96. I started Fair Trade USA in 98, thinking I would do it for a couple of years and go right back to the mountains of Nicaragua, where I belong. And here I am. We just celebrated our 15th anniversary. And um, Fair Trade USA is a nonprofit organization, a 501c3 nonprofit, mission-driven organization. But we sit at the hub of the fair trade, the broader fair trade community. So we don't buy or sell products. We certify. We audit and certify products and companies that do. Uh, today, we work with more than 800 great brands and retailers from Walmart and Starbucks to mom and pop um, local companies as well. We now certify 40 different product categories from coffee and chocolate to flowers and now increasingly manufactured products. We just launched apparel with Patagonia. Uh, we uh, have 40% consumer awareness of our label. 40% of American adults have seen the Fairtrade certified label, and about half say they've bought Fairtrade products in the last month. Um, we work now with almost 2 million farming families in 60 countries around the world, and um, we are helping to change lives together with our partners for those families every day. And when I say we, I mean you too, because... Every time we choose a fair trade cup of coffee or banana or chocolate bar when we shop, we are helping keep kids in school and help keeping um, families on a road out of poverty. So I, 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 clearly I'm a nonprofit guy, but I live in the world of business, and my ability to do that is directly related to my experience here, to the tools, to the networks, and to the inspiration that I got as a student. And so... Um, what better stage for me to be talking on uh, than this one today? So a quick reflection about why I think fair trade and things like it are, are taking off. I see two macro trends at play um, today. One in terms of consumers. I think consumers increasingly are asking, where does our stuff come from? Especially food, right? Where does my food come from? Mm -hmm. Is it safe? Is it healthy? Is it environmentally sustainable? Was there child labor involved in it? We want to know where our stuff comes from. And this trend is growing. And the other macro trend that we see is around corporate behavior. Mm -hmm. And I work in supply chains and global supply chains, and I see this very clearly. Companies are no longer able to be indifferent to the global supply chain. Companies are increasingly realizing, smart business leaders are increasingly realizing that the sustainability and the reliability and the resilience of their supply chain, not just in environmental terms, but in social terms as well, is intimately connected to long-term shareholder value, right? So smart business leaders want transparency in the supply chain. Smart business leaders want to know that those workers and farmers are taken care of. They want, don't want to be bit in the ass by a reputational scandal, a building collapse in Bangladesh or a child labor scandal in West Africa. But it's more than that. It's about quality and quantity and price and reliability over the long term. And so you see all kinds of companies starting to think about how they can get closer to the other end of the supply chain. I love that. I love that. And I think that's a macro trend. We're seeing the evolution of, of, of the way smart business leaders are thinking from corporate philanthropy yeah. to CSR and now to really taking hold of the business model itself and trying to figure out how to break this contradiction between profitability on the one hand and sustainability on the other. This notion that you can only get one or the other, but not both. Today's smart business leaders are looking for ways to use sustainability to drive profitability. And our movement and so many others are, I believe, on the cutting edge of that leading business phenomenon, helping companies wed those two. And it's high time, because if we don't get it done quickly, it'll be too late. 
My parting thought. We're all blessed. Each and every one of us. We are all blessed. We have so much to be grateful for. And I would argue that one of our greatest blessings is to live in a time where what we do makes a difference. To live in a time where the products that we buy make a difference. Where the ventures that we start or that we join make a difference. Where the institutes that we launch makes a difference. So I just feel so proud to be in a room with so many kindred spirits who recognize that blessing and who each of us in our own way are out there making a difference. Thank you. (laughs) So you might imagine I I take that as my own inspirational piece. I can watch that over and over again because his eloquence in telling the story is just... Uh, and the personal feeling, the understanding, you know, he talks about the macro trends. I mean, he's basically saying, I'm sitting here, I can see these macro trends, and I, and I, and I can help shape them. So uh, this, for me, is when I, when I, at the end of a busy day, if I need inspiration to go on to build the institute, <laughs> I'm watching Paul. And we actually got him to come to uh, the uh, to the New York event as well. And by the way, just to think about it, you know, he is in the nonprofit space, but I know from talking with him, this is easily something, he could be in the for-profit space. There are an amazing number of companies now who are going to fair trade and saying, will you work with us to make sure we have a responsible supply chain? Will you help us define what responsible supply chain means, and will you help us make sure we do it? So it's a kind of, you know, the, the, the notion here of companies coming to him and saying, work with us. I'm just saying it's, it's very interesting. There's a business model here, a different business model. That's not the business model he chose. But the fact that the companies are coming to him with those requests is very, very revealing and underscores the macro trends that he was talking about.